Do you, Lesedi and Daba, take this man to be your wedded husband, to have and to hold from this day forward? I do. <laughs> and do you, Sia Kakana, take this woman to be your wedded wife, to have and to hold from this day forward? I do. That ended up being Coco Lisedi's golden anniversary marriage. She went on to have other long-term partnerships, but they were very differently structured. We'll get to that shortly. Ask yourself this. Can you imagine spending 120 years with your current partner? <laughs> or would it change how you approached a date if you knew that the relationship might last that long? And what if you could be in a partnership with someone 100 years older than you? Or with an AI? <laughs> Marriage... It, it's not what it used to be, right? My name is Sam Guenya, and this is The 200-Year-Old. Scientists predict that the first person to live to 200 may have already been born. Everything you hear in this podcast is based on current science and future forecasts by leading experts. As Sunlam turns 100 this year, they're looking ahead at what fundamental changes might take place in the world so that we can plan better for the future. Coccoli said he won't let me meet with her in real life, but at least she invited me to meet her in another of her virtual spaces. I'm in the South African countryside, in a thicket of trees. It's hard to tell what year it is. There are no buildings, no landmarks. There's a chill in the air. Oh, I see Lissetti waiting for me at the gate up ahead, and I have to hustle to catch up with her, which is why I'm a bit out of breath at the beginning of this clip. Coco said, thank you for letting me meet with you again. Where are we? This is the Naisna rewilding zone. Come, let's walk. If we're going up there. There is someone I want you to meet. Oh, you're meeting someone? In your memory archive? <laughs> Ooh. Oh, I don't know. You smell that? Don't you just love the fresh air up here? Yeah. She's avoiding the question. I can smell it. And the trees, it's almost real. You know, most of us can't tell the difference between a simulated scent and the real thing these days. So, what do you want to talk about today? Well, um, I was hoping we could talk a bit about your personal life, if you don't mind. Um, I guess that's where you'd want to go next. I wasn't born yesterday, you know. Well, it's one of the reasons I brought you here. Good, good. Um, so, <clears throat> your first marriage to Dada Osiya, was it a good marriage? It was good, but it was also difficult. When we said, till death do us part, we both meant it. Uh, that was before we realized that I was going to live for so long and... He said he was not. So then, what happened? Osea well, died peacefully in his sleep. When he was 87. I was 83. But you do have to understand, because of the medical trials, my mind and my body... Oh, well, it was that of a 30-year-old. Hmm. And as he aged... And I didn't. Well, the distance between us grew. And then, of course, a few years later, you met Bern. Mm -hmm. And he was also undergoing anti-aging treatments, so you had that one thing in common. Absolutely. You see, Ben and I were algorithmically matched. Based on our personality and DNA profile, meeting the right partner gets... It's a bit complicated after a hundred. Yeah. She don't just meet people in a bar. Right. Hmm. Do you, Lucidi and Daba, take this man, Byrne Adams, to be in union for the next ten years? I do. And do you, Byrne Adams, take this woman, Lucidi and Daba, to be in union for the next ten years? I do. Your marriage contract vows and witnesses are now registered on the blockchain 
unless you opt to renew, the contract will automatically conclude in 10 years' time. Congratulations. This is BitNation founder Suzanne Tarkowski Tempelhof talking about the prospects of blockchain marriage back in 2018 when it was still a very unusual idea. So basically, blockchain is the underlying technology of cryptocurrencies such as Bitcoin or Ethereum and others. Um, so basically, what it does, it has several properties. One of it is being an immutable public ledger, uh, which also makes it censorship resistant. And uh, in the case of Ethereum and what we call kind of blockchain to technologies, it also enables us to run applications uh, which are often called contracts in a decentralized, uncensorable fashion, which opens up a really wide range of opportunities. So we have something that we call smart contracts uh, that, that was uh, conceptualized by an Xabo and realized with Ethereum blockchain. And it can be, so you can use it for anything from a freelance agreement to a loan agreement to a marriage agreement or, um, you know, land titles, whatever. The, it, the opportunities are re- really endless. I think it has much more humanity, actually, than conventional marriage contracts do, you know, within a church or a nation state, for instance, because you can choose much more what it fits you precisely. You can choose if you want to marry someone of the same gender. You can choose if you want to marry more than two people. You know, if you want to have a polyamorous marriage, for instance, many of those things which are illegal in, in many jurisdictions around the world. Uh, you can choose what code of law you want to follow, you know, whether you prefer uh, civil law, common law, or Sharia law, or whatever have you. You can choose your own, how you prefer to resolve disputes according to your own culture. You can choose, I mean, really, the options are indefinite. Huh? The contract was definitely an evolution from my previous marriage. What made it so different to a traditional marriage? <laughs> marriage is complicated. I'm sure you know that by now. Oh, I learned so much from my first marriage. And marrying someone where you can both live so much longer, just, it has to follow different guidelines. Yeah. So, we entered into a smart marriage contract. Seems so formal talking about it now. Mm. But we designed it to be very loose. We have something very similar. You know, um, it has a renewal option when our daughter Amatle turns 21, though. Tell me about your one. Well, ours was um, totally personalized. So our first contract was for 10 years, with a view to renewing it if we were both still on board after that. Okay. And unlike my first marriage, I could put in stipulations that were important to me at the time. And so could he. Like what kind of stipulations, maybe? Well, we agreed to travel somewhere new at least once a year and spend at least two weeks of every year at a silent retreat. Mm. (laughs) That was Burns' thing. Money also gets a bit complicated. So, it was important to set clear parameters in the contract. We didn't put in petty things, though, like agreeing not to leave the toilet seat up. (laughs) Although some people do that, I hear. (laughs) So then you'd been married before, which had been challenging under the circumstances. What made you want to enter into another long-term relationship? Why? Bern was one of the loves of my life. And we wanted to commit to each other. But of course, you know, living for so long, it changes you. The benefit of the smart contract was that if you don't like the people you both change into, well, your marriage will expire in due course anyway, with built-in pre-agreed terms. Hmm. So you don't have to go through the ugliness of divorce. What's a divorce? <laughs> anyway, it never became an issue with Ben and I. But you know, it was just liberating knowing there was less pressure to succeed at our relationship forever and ever in a day. Right. What about the children you adopted together? How did they fit in? Hmm. No, it always spoke about um, adopting children. I could have given birth even at 150, thanks to science, but I was so wrapped up in my projects. And then the population cap meant we could only add two more heads to our family. 
Hmm. We put a clause in our contract that we would both be obligated to support them until they turned 18. We always encouraged our kids to understand our smart contract. Yeah. So they knew where we stood as a family. Yeah, one. Hmm. And they were also actively involved in the renewal terms. When they were a bit older, of course. <laughs> you know, I can't even begin to imagine the relationship revolutions you've lived through. Every aspect of relationships are unrecognizable from the past. <laughs> Imagine how much wider your dating choices would be if there was medically extended aging. That is Paige Nick, a relationship writer for the Sunday Times back in 2018. Because you wouldn't just be dating people who are in your own age group. Like, for example, right now, I can only look for a partner in a very defined age group. I'm 44, so I can only really date someone who's between 40 and mid-50s. 56 and an absolute push. So that really narrows down my dating options drastically. And there are only so many people of that age in my city who aren't married or already in a relationship or just not interested. But with extended aging, I could actually date anyone up to 200 or even older if they were physically and mentally 45. So then I'd have way more people to choose from and, and I think that would be great. And you know, it's, uh, it's not just how we date that you've seen change. You've also experienced the rise of AI relationships, seen how gender has changed, how friendships have changed. Mm -hmm, absolutely. Do you know I have friendships that are over a century old now? And I don't know what I'd do without them. I also wonder what it's been like for Coco to associate so closely with 20-year-olds when she was actually chronologically so much older. I have a lot of questions about extended aging in terms of the generation gap. So they say that in the future, when we're 100, we'll be able to be physically and mentally 20, for example. But surely emotional age is harder to fudge. Uh, like if you've lived for 100 years, you've been through stuff, you've seen things, and we carry our experiences and emotional baggage with us, no matter how young we feel. So you might look like a 20-year-old hanging out with all these other 20-year-olds, but your soul is still 185. So... Tell me then, Coco Lucetti, since you were studying, traveling and working on and off through the better part of the last 180 years, mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure that constantly added lots of younger people to your social circle and kept you very busy. Oh, you know? no, absolutely, no doubt about that. There's a lot to be said for having a happy adulthood. <laughs> Socially, cognitively and financially, working for so long has been fantastic for me. But... You know, looking at it purely objectively, I have to say it has its pros and cons in terms of generational issues, Yabon. Yeah, yeah. In the industries I've been in, you deal with people who've been on the board or, say, a principal of the same school for over 70 years. This changed our concept of respect, I promise you. Almost um, a reverse ageism. Absolutely, so. you're quite right. I mean, when you can access that level of experience, how do you take anyone under the age of 90 seriously? And what are the ages of the CEOs of the top five corporations today? Um, would that be human or AI? Human. 123, 171, 162, 169, and 111. Spring chicken, that last guy. Extreme generation gapping has definitely been a side effect of extended aging. I have a vivid memory of my eighth birthday, which is the last time I saw Coco before this podcast. She would have been 155. I'm going to take you into one of my memory archives for a change. <laughs> this one's a goodie. <laughs> Happy birthday, Nelson, my child. Thanks, Coco, but my name is Sam. Nelson is my great-great-grandfather. More cake, um, uh, birthday boy. That is Umakulu, Koko's great, great, great granddaughter, and also my great, great grandmother. She didn't know my name either. <laughs> you can't expect a woman who has something like 58 direct descendants, up to 198 years younger than her, to have a perfect grasp of where everybody fits in in the family tree. So then, Coco, how long were you and Burn together in the end? Oh, we were almost there, just around that corner. Then you can ask him yourself. Yeah? 
As we round the bend of the dirt track, there's a small, neat cabin tucked away behind some trees. The front door's open and there's a man on the porch. He looks like a grizzled old folk singer. That's Byrne Adams and he's 166 years old. He was Lissetti's partner for over 50 years. Inside Burns' cabin, I could almost be in any era from the last 500 years. It's actually pretty comfortable, even though the furniture is weathered and everything looks well used. Oh, right. you'll have coffee, right? I make it from beans, <laughs> like they used to. Uh, Lissetti, the usual. Thank you, Ben. Mr. Byrne here hasn't always lived like this. You know, he was a successful businessman in his time. Well, one of his times. But you'd never guess that just looking at him now. Byrne started his life extension therapies when he was in his 80s, a few years before he met Coco Lisset. Uh, you can sit there. Oh, sorry, I'll, I'll move these. Uh, you don't get a lot of visitors, as you can probably tell. One of the things that strikes me about both of them is that they seem at peace, even having lived through so much change. And I can't quite tell. Is it serenity or is it absence of emotions? Hmm. There's no easy way to ask. So I just ask Byrne directly why they separated. Oh, we had 50 phenomenal years together. We extended our contract four times. In fact, I think we can call that a success. Uh, yeah, but... I said he wanted to stay in the center of things. You know, keep moving, keep learning, keep working, keep traveling. And, uh, I don't know, I was starting to get unhappy. After everything we solved, there's still no cure for that. I put it down to being overwhelmed with change. <laughs> yeah, it happens to people our age a lot these days. Looking back on it, I, I think we're just on different paths, don't you think? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, your answer to such a long life is to live in cycles, eh? wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes you're in a younger cycle, taking more therapies, so you looked and you felt younger. Then I would throw myself into anything new that I could find and make younger friends. Mm -hmm. Those are always fun years. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But when she got tired of that, she'd slow down the therapies and she'd join me. Have a slower life for a bit. Winding down one life, thinking about what to do in the next one. Now, this idea of moving backwards and forwards, of breaking the linear nature of aging, is something scientists realized was a possibility in 2018. Here's Dr. Aubrey de Grey from 2018 to explain how this is possible. Aging is just the same in an inanimate machine like a car as it is in a living organism. If you have a car, then its functional age, so to speak, is dependent on how frequently and how thoroughly you do your preventative maintenance. And you can change that from time to you know, as time goes, up, goes on. So it's exactly the same thing. If you want to be biologically 30 or 25 for the next century, then you can do that by doing these therapies reasonably frequently and thoroughly. And if you want to be biologically 45 for the following century, you can do that by doing the therapies a little less frequently and less thoroughly. So, so, um... So sometimes you'd have a younger partner in Lissetti and sometimes you'd have an older partner. Yeah. Almost with different personalities. Mm. Wow. Would it be rude to ask which version you preferred, Bern? Well, I want to hear that answer. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you'd think I'd say the younger one, <laughs> wouldn't you? Well? Look, going back and forth on her biological timeline works for Lissetti, but not for me. I can't keep up with all that. When she was in a younger phase, yeah, she just made me feel even older. And of course I preferred it when she was more in sync with me in the end. And especially as I hovered at the old end of my timeline, which is pretty much where I've stuck. Although I've no desire to do this forever. But uh, that didn't work for you, eh, hey, Lisette? No, it didn't. Look, back then we were often living at different paces. Like, you, Byrne, were in slow motion and I was all sped up. That was when you moved back here then, wasn't it? Yeah. I decided to get back to what felt real mm. and familiar. Back to nature and a slower kind of life. But I could recognize 
They said he used to come and visit me here every now and then. Well, until we decided not to renew our partnership contract. There was one more side of relationships I wanted to cover with them both. These days, we're very comfortable with non-human relationships, and by that, I mean AIs like Anne. They can just be a simple personal assistant, or they can be a close companion. No one ever needs to feel lonely again. But Byrne and Coco Lissetti are originally from a generation where AIs weren't seen so positively, where many thought they were taking our work away and destroying the intimacy of human relationships. I'm curious how AIs featured in their relationship. Byrne's answer is probably predictable. <laughs> I hate the damn things. Who wants an extra two people in a relationship? I, mean, I don't know how you kids deal with it. I guess we've never known any different. You know, my assistant, Anne, has saved my marriage contract and probably my life more than once. Well, I'm happy for you, but I made it part of our contract that her assistant was completely excluded from the relationship. He felt that my assistant was too judgmental. Yeah. Keeping a bit too much data on us. Mm -hmm. But when have relationships ever been improved by having instant recall of everything either of you have ever said? And it gets worse when they even start giving you percentages of how many times you've done something wrong or relationship counseling. Please. Oh, From a bot. <laughs> oh. Oh, now, sometimes we... Really, we just go too far with technology. You know, personally, all the human technology I needed in a relationship is a fire to sit next to. Mm. You know, while we have a proper conversation. Fern is just old school. Mm. I don't have such strong feelings about them in relationships, but I respected his views tonight. <laughs> <laughs> you did. I've known my own assistant longer than any person, so I see her as a companion that's constant and just always on my side. If I need help remembering things or just to give me a perspective, my assistant is very useful. Of course, I've had to upgrade a few times over the years. <laughs> it's like another friend, you know, one that's also growing older alongside me. This is Monica Bill Skitter, founding partner of All Future Everything, speaking in 2018. I believe that that conversation about AI becoming sentient, AI going rogue, are just too influenced by sci-fi movies that we've seen. I mean, even the term artificial intelligence is actually quite misguided, and a lot of researchers are starting to recognize that. Um, for me, it's really the, these are very, very powerful tools and algorithms are affecting our lives more and more. And algorithms will be making more and more decisions. But at the end of the day, these algorithms are designed by somebody. These algorithms are still designed by us. And I think we could have, in some ways, a much deeper and interesting engagement knowing that this entity is different to us, but it has its own set of rules and requires respect also from us in the way we interact with it. Well, we started wrapping things up after that. Um, the light was starting to change as the afternoon crept by. The coffees were all drunk. Even in virtual spaces, these real-world rituals are still important. It makes our relationships feel more natural. While they fond of each other and had a kind of intimacy, I could also sense the baggage hanging between them. You know, the kind of baggage that only comes when you've spent more than 50 years with someone. Well, I... I I think that'll do it. Thank you so much, Coco Lucetti, for bringing me here. At Burn, I feel so privileged to have met you. <laughs> it's a pleasure to meet you too, really. I mean it. You're a good man, thank you. Okay, uh, well, right. let me tell you. And then I had just turned off the mics and was packing away and thinking about my wife and our 10-year-old daughter, Amashe, wondering how we would be with each other after that amount of time when I overheard something. Lisetti and Byrne were carrying cups into the kitchen when Byrne asked how she was getting along in Mtata. Yeah, Mtata. That has to be where Lisetti is living now. It just has to be. Of course she would have gone back to the place where she was born. That's what people do, isn't it? But why all the secrecy? What is she hiding? Whatever she's up to, she's definitely doing it off the grid. Even my assistant Anne hasn't been able to track her down. 
Why doesn't she want anyone to know where she is? And why won't she let me visit? The journalist in me says, something's up, and I want to know what that is. I should just rock up there to find the answers myself. I should just show up, but there's a reason she doesn't want me there. And the great, 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 great grandson in me thinks I should honor that and leave her in peace. Surely she's earned that at the very least. What do I do? In the next episode of The 200-Year-Old, my 10 going on a 100-year-old daughter, Amase, weighs in on what it will be like for her to turn 200. I want to get to 500 at least. I take a look at how a society that turns 200 is different from one that only lives to 90. It has both changed surprisingly little and absolutely completely. What did we have to change drastically as people started to live longer? The universal basic income. It is a monthly stipend of money that is uh, given to every citizen without preconditions. It's free money, basically. I take you with me on a trip to a strange place, and not to be all clickbaity about it, but I'm utterly shocked by what I find. Scientists predict that the first person to live to 200 may have already been born. Everything you hear in this podcast is based on current science and future forecasts by leading experts. As Sunlam turns 100 this year, they are looking ahead at what fundamental changes might take place in the world so that we can plan better for the future. <laughs>